Hello, my name is Christopher Adler, and this video is about this instrument, the CAN, the bamboo free reed mouth organ from Laos and Northeast Thailand. This video is primarily intended for composers who are going to be writing for the instrument, and it should work as a companion to the PDF guide to composers that you can find on my website. So in the description of this video, I'll place a link to my website where you can download the guide for free. And it has all the same figures and pieces and excerpts that you're gonna see in this video. And I follow the same structure as the guide. So if you really wanna get into it, maybe you can download the guide first and follow along as we do the video. Uh, this video may also be useful for players of the can to know its capabilities and to see how best those capabilities are notated. In the fourth section of this video, I will be demonstrating some traditional styles of playing, although that's not the primary focus of this video. So if you want to learn more about traditional playing techniques, you can also download the guide and I put some references in there to solid sources that go into detail on traditional playing. Before we go any further, let's hear the can. So as I mentioned, the can is an instrument of the Lao people who live in Laos and in Northeast Thailand. Um, but it is not played exclusively by the Lao. It's been taken up by a number of other ethnic groups in the region. So in this video, when I do talk about traditional playing, I'll primarily be talking about the styles of Lao music. Be aware that there are other ways to play the instrument, which are quite fascinating and beautiful. For example, check out recordings by the Kumu people, who also use an instrument they call the can, and it is the same instrument minus the top two pipes, but the style of playing is entirely different than anything I'll be discussing today. The can is an instrument from a rural folk tradition. It is not from a courtly or a classical tradition, so the can musical tradition does not have some of the things that are associated with more courtly or classical traditions, such as an extended body of repertoire, a strong sense of historical development, revered composers or performers, etc. Um, in fact, the can tradition has historically had a great deal of regional variation. Um, in the past, and even in through the 20th century, travel through Laos and Northeast Thailand was not that easy, and so regions were able to develop very distinctive musical styles. Nowadays, that people can move around the region much more easily, and of course, recordings it can be exchanged, and people can hear one another play nowadays over the internet, those regional styles have turned into a kind of a repertoire. So even though people, uh, individual genres may be named in association with a region. In fact, you'll find those genres played all over the place, not exclusively in that region. Um, another thing, as I said, this is not from a courtly tradition, and one does not have to be devoted to a master teacher in order to learn this tradition. A young can player nowadays can learn this in school, but even traditionally could study with multiple musicians. They can pick up things on their own by ear, just by listening to people play, by listening to recordings and imitating. It is primarily an improvised tradition. And that means that people, uh, can players, develop their own individual styles of playing by listening to different players, uh, by working with other singers and other musicians, and kind of developing their own way of playing the instrument. There is not one right way to play any of the traditional repertoire. In fact, there's a lot of individual and regional variation. The way I think about it is that developing a voice through the instrument is a kind of developing an individual voice is part of the tradition. And so my approach to the instrument, which was first to learn the traditional music, but then to branch out and to try to do a contemporary and experimental improvisation, and then finally compose for the instrument, is all sort of in accordance with that pathway of figuring out my individual voice through the instrument and what I would like that to be. 
And so doing contemporary music for the can is not something to be afraid of. It's not going to offend anybody. There's not a kind of sacred ritual repertoire that's going to be violated if you play it. There's no uh, master teachers uh, that demand discipleship before you're permitted to do uh, experimental work, as there may be in other classical and courtly traditions. Here it's a much more casual thing. In fact, nowadays uh, there's a great deal of innovation associated with the can going on in Laos and North. East Thailand. It is played in pop ensembles. Um, it is played in classical groups. There are composers who write for the instrument. Um, and there are even innovators who are changing the instrument itself, adding more pipes and things like that to make it more suitable for adaptation to contemporary styles. So to composers who are thinking about writing for the instrument, I encourage you to do that. There's nothing you need to worry about. Um, and you can use this guide to help you do that. So if you are a composer and, you're, and you are inspired to write for the can, please feel free to get in touch with me via my website. I'm always interested in seeing new pieces. Finally, you'll notice throughout this video that I use Western notation. That is, of course, in part because of my background as a musician, having trained in the classical tradition and being most familiar with Western notation. But it is also now something of a standard to notate can music in this way. It began most likely with Ajahn Dr. Jarun Chai Chun Pairot, who's the foremost scholar in Northeast Thailand of the can tradition. And at the, in the early 70s, if not, if not even before that, he was using the same notation system that I'll be explaining in this video. Um, it was then popularized by Dr. Terry Miller, who's written extensively on traditional can playing, and you'll find references to his work in the PDF document that I mentioned on my website. So this has now become the standard way for notating. It's the, certainly the easiest way for me to read any kind of new music written for the instrument, and it is now used in schools, and you'll find it in publications in Thailand. So notation-wise, this is the way to go. There is a traditional Thai notation system System using the letters that stand in for solfege syllables, do, re, mi, but it doesn't have the same flexibility both in terms of polyphonic detail or rhythmic detail that Western music does. So in terms of writing contemporary music, the Western notation system that I'm introducing in this video is the way to go. Now that said, if you're writing a piece, I am certainly interested in and willing to look at experimental and indeterminate notations. There's just no reason to develop a new notation system for the can if the traditional one will suffice. So by all means, please do consider experimental and indeterminate notations if they're adding something that the standard notation does not make possible. The can is constructed of 16 bamboo pipes in two rows. So this is called the can bat or can eight because it refers to the eight pairs of pipes. Be aware that there are other versions of the instrument with seven pairs of pipes or nine pairs of pipes and even a little one with three, but by far the can bat is the most common configuration. So if you're writing for the can, this is the one you should write for. It is a free read instrument. So let me show you what that means. Here is a pipe I've removed from one of the can so that you can see the reed which is inside. I'm going to hold this up to the camera and see if you can see that. That is a very tiny little brass reed. If I touch it with my finger, you can see that there's a tongue cut out of the middle that's able to move up and down. It can move in and out of the plane of the, the reed there when air is forced through it. So that's the reed, and each one of the pipes has a reed like that in it. Now there's also three additional holes cut into the instrument. You can see the finger hole here that's very close to the reed. And then if I back away and then turn it around, you'll see two more holes cut into the instrument. Those are the sound holes. That defines the speaking length of the pipe. So when the reed couples with that speaking length of the pipe, it then makes a pitch. So air has to be forced through the reed, and this finger hole has to be covered. If the finger hole is not covered, it works like an escape valve, and it causes that speaking length of the pipe to be too short for the reed to sound. So if I blow through, no sound. If I cover up the finger hole, then the reed will sound. 
So each one of these pipes is then set inside a wooden wind chest. Here's the instrument from which I removed this pipe. And you can see, look carefully here, <laughs> there's the hole where it goes. So this, this pipe can actually be inserted right back into that hole. And I'm not going to be able to do it because it's not going to fit right now. But all those reeds would line up inside the wooden wind chest. Okay, so when the instrument uh, is all put together, here's my put together instrument. If I just blow through the instrument, it makes some little artifact sounds, but basically none of the pipes will be able to speak if those finger holes are not covered. But once one of those holes is covered, then the pipe can speak. Okay, and it's a free reed, which means it doesn't matter which way the air passes through the reed for it to sound. So I can also draw air in through the instrument and it makes the same sound, the same pitch, because it's the same reed that's being activated. Uh, the correct terms, I believe, for that are to talk about the blow and the draw, but I often talk about it blowing in or blowing out. So when I'm writing music and I need to indicate breath direction, and later in the video, I'll explain why it might be necessary to indicate breath direction. I just use a letter I or letter O for the breath direction. It goes in or out. Um, so the can should be thought of as a polyphonic instrument, because as many whole finger holes as you can cover, that's how many pipes will sound. So with 10 fingers, you can cover up to 10 pipes. So it's best to think of this as a polyphonic instrument. And if you use uh, any kind of putty substance to cover an additional hole, you can get even more pipes to sound. Because the can is a handmade instrument from natural materials, you'll find that there can be variation in how they sound. In the next section of the video, I'm going to talk about the pitch of the can and what you can expect. But understand that there can be some small deviations between different instruments and even within the same instrument as to the exact pitch that is produced and the exact timbre that's produced by each pipe. Each reed has its own little characteristics. Um, and as a result, there can be what seem like inconsistencies within the instrument itself. It's just part of the character of the instrument. It's not really something that you can predict or control. I heard a show player describe the Japanese mouth organ as being a bundle of 17 different instruments. And I think that's a good way to understand what a free reed instrument is like. Each of the pipes has its own characteristics in terms of voicing, in terms of exactly how much wind it takes the pipe to speak, how that changes on the blow versus the draw, how the timbre of each pipe changes on the blow versus the draw, and even the dynamic profile, like how loud each individual pipe is able to get given a certain level of wind pressure and there's inconsistencies across the instrument and then each instrument will have different characteristics. As the pipes get bigger they speak a little bit more slowly. Some of the instruments are overall brighter in timbre, others are darker. So when it comes to solo repertoire I will try a piece on a number of different instruments and try to find the instruments that suits the character of the music the best. So in general the then I wouldn't ask a composer to tell me what pitch level to play for a solo piece because I want to be able to choose from all the different instruments the one that I think is going to work best with that individual piece. Also, if the wind pressure is too low, sometimes the reeds will sound without coupling to the pipe and then they make a note that has nothing to do with how the instrument sounds. For example, that's because the wind pressure is too low. So if I cover up the holes and I play with enough wind pressure, then it won't make that sound. But in playing soft music or a phrase that sort of tapers al niente or something, there's a risk that those kind of artifacts will appear. That's not to say not to do it, um, but it's just another characteristic of the instrument to be aware of. In this section of the video, I'm going to talk about the pitches of the can and the standard notation system. So I'm going to place on the screen the pitches available and how they should be notated. So as you can see, the can plays a two octave minor scale that we notate from A below middle C going up. 
Now the can is a transposing instrument. It's made to a number of different sizes and therefore a number of different pitch levels. But the can always has this interval structure and the interval structure matches the fingering pattern. That's why it is best considered as a transposing instrument. Um, so for this video, I'm using a can which is at concert pitch. One difference now between the can and between Western music is that when we say at concert pitch with a can, we're going to talk about a can in A or a can in A minor because it refers to the lowest note of the scale that it plays, which is played by the right thumb. Uh, so we don't say concert pitch is C major or in C. We're actually going to say it's in A. So I have in my hand a can in A and it plays the notes that you see on the screen. And if you're astute, you notice that there are 16 pipes, but only 15, pipe, 15 pitches on the screen. That's because the lower G is duplicated on both sides. There's one over here and one over here. So all told, that gives 16 pipes. As a transposing instrument, the can can be made to a number of different pitch levels, and you can refer to that pitch level by whatever the lowest note of the scale that it plays is. And in fact, if you're going to go to Laos or Northeast Thailand and purchase a can, you should generally refer to that lowest note as the one that you want. So the most common one nowadays is one that's designed to play with Western instruments, and so the can in A, which plays the notes you see on the screen, is quite common. But you can find can to all all different kinds of pitch levels and typically makers will have a western pitch pipe and you just say give me that note um, and if you want to be extra safe you can say the note that's played by the right thumb which is the lowest note should be a or whichever one that you want they tend to be on the larger side from here can and g i have a number of those and in f here for example is my largest instrument it's a can in D. It transposes down a fifth from what you see notated on the instrument. And you can see if I hold it back, it's a significantly larger instrument. And it has a deep, rich tone. But like I mentioned in the previous section, those large low pipes can speak more slowly. So for very fast music, this instrument, for example, would not be a good choice. I might choose one of the higher pitched instruments. They come even bigger than this, um, but I find that getting them back to the United States can be pretty challenging if they're much larger than this. And those lower pipes take more air to make a good sound. So one of the most interesting characteristics of the can is the fingering pattern. And as I mentioned, the fingering pattern corresponds to this interval structure that you see on the screen uh, on all the instruments, regardless of the pitch level. It'll always play that two octave minor scale. But the fingering pattern is quite counterintuitive at first. And remember, it doesn't correspond to this shape of the pipes that you see. This shape is purely decorative. So now I'm going to put on the screen a fingering chart. And you can ch find this chart in the PDF packet on my website, so you don't have to try to jot it down off the screen. This is as though you're looking down from the top of the instrument. And you can see I've indicated uh, the positions of the finger holes, and this is really critical. So if you look at the side of the instrument, you notice that there are six pipes in the middle that have a row of holes, but the pipes at the end are special. The pipe at this end, closest to where I blow, has the holes facing me, and that's for my thumbs. Okay, so those notes are controlled only by the thumbs. The inner six pipes are played by fingers two, three, and four. So I'm numbering them like we do on piano, where thumb is number one and pinky is number five. So fingers two, three, and four play any of these pipes. And then finally, you'll notice the pinky hole on the last pipe is much lower. So it's designed for the short pinky to sit comfortably. But what that means is that it's really hard for the thumb or the pinky to get out of position and play another pipe. Later in the video, I'll discuss the conditions under which that's possible. But traditionally, that is not done. Traditionally, the fingering is as you see on the screen. 
What's quite unique about the can is that the layout of the pitches is really quite counterintuitive. It might not be evident from what you see on the screen now, so here are the pitches on each side of the instrument. So let me demonstrate. Here is the left side. And here's the right side. So you see the intervals on each side of the instrument are kind of an unusual and unpredictable pattern of steps and skips. The design of the instrument is quite ingenious because the pitches are laid out such that you can play in a number of different pentatonic or five note scales without changing finger position. And the reason that's advantageous is because when I'm holding the instrument close to my face, I can't really see the positions of the holes. I'm playing by feel. So traditionally, it's possible to set the fingers down into one position and have no lateral motion or just a little bit of lateral motion. And what that means is it's easy to play. It's easy to find the notes and it's possible to move very quickly between them. For example, okay, and I can play all that without seeing the pipes because my fingers are actually not changing position. Um, so that's how it's designed traditionally, and I'll explain in the next section how that works specifically. Uh, what to be aware of from the standpoint of composing contemporary music is that you have certain note combinations which are possible and certain note combinations which are not possible. So certain notes can obviously only be played on that side, and they can only be played by certain fingers. The primary flexibility of the instrument comes from the middle three fingers being able to cover all six of these pipes. Uh, and there is no limitation as to what is difficult to reach. So it's just as easy to play all three notes at the bottom here as it is to play all three at the top or any combination. So I can stretch between all those different notes and it's no problem and it's easy to get around. Concerning the finger positions on the middle three fingers, a couple things to bear in mind are that it's not possible to cross over. So for example, if I'm playing very legato music and I want to go from a three note chord and I want to move that middle note down to the lowest note, I've got to swap which, I've got to swap what the second finger is doing and there's going to be a little gap in the sound. So if you hear that G, there's a little bit of hiccup in order to make that switch. That's only relevant for very legato playing. If there's any kind of breath or tongue articulation, it completely covers up that skip. Another thing to bear in mind, and this was an issue in a piece I played recently, is that if a couple of fingers are committed to sustaining notes, it limits what your capabilities of the remaining finger are. Obviously, they can only reach those notes, but also uh, it takes time to get from one to another. And so the one piece I was playing, these two notes were being held, and I had to play very rapidly between these three notes, which is possible, and it works, but you'll notice that the sound then becomes very staccato because I've got to lift my finger off one pipe before I can get to the next one, in particular when it's leaping over a note like that. So again, there's kind of a gap in a sound. So it's totally fine, it's totally possible, it's just not going to be legato. Control over the breath provides one of the most expressive aspects of can music. Because the can sounds whether the breath goes in or out, it's the responsibility of the player to develop careful breath control in both directions of playing. Traditionally, continuous playing is idiomatic, 
And so in the context of a traditional performance, a player might have to play for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes or longer without stopping. But because they can get a good amount of air in through the instrument while they're playing, this generally is not too fatiguing. And even in my own compositions, I have a piece, for example, Epilogue for a Dark Day that calls for 12 minutes of continuous playing. And with a good quality instrument, if the volume of air required to play is not too high, this is really not a problem at all. Traditionally, the music is this unbroken stream of sound, so the kind of breath control required means to supply a very continuous and steady amount of air on the out-breath and then to suddenly switch and provide a balanced and equal amount of air on the in-breath. So the control over the breath in traditional playing that's the goal, is this very steady flow of air with an almost imperceptible switch between them. Now something to bear in mind is there is always going to be a kind of rhythmic articulation when the breath changes direction. So you can tell when the breath changes direction. Traditionally, the music is fairly articulated rhythmically through tonguing, and that covers up those breath changes. So the changes in breath direction are covered up because, or they're made invisible by the fact that all the notes are rhythmically articulated. Um, but it's also possible to play this more like other kinds of wind instruments with tapered phrases or shaped phrases. And in that case, then I think the responsibility of the player is to be able to have maximum control over the shaping of phrases, regardless of breath direction. It is not possible to maintain a perfect legato for longer than one breath length. Uh, but I can't really say how long a breath length is because different instruments require a different amount of air. So what I recommend doing is indicating a desired phrasing with slurs, and I'll usually do my best to either put those in one breath or to make the, any changes of breath that are required as subtle as possible and to put them in a place that's as musically unobtrusive as possible. In terms of articulations, tonguing provides most of the expressive articulations that the instrument can produce. And articulations can generally be notated as you would with any other instrument. So you can put accents and staccatos and tenudos and all that stuff. And I'll pretty much interpret it as you would with any other wind instrument. Um, the tonguing that I do can be very light or sort of a very, a very subtle modification of the tone. Or it can be, I'll sort of do a medium one and then a strong one. So it can be pretty punchy, but without being discontinuous. But the airflow can also be interrupted as more like a, a, dis, a disconnected or a staccato style of playing. There are three different ways to achieve staccato, with the breath, with tonguing, and just with the fingers. These can also be combined, and this will produce a lot of variety in articulations. So let me demonstrate some of these effects. With just the breath, I'm just going to put bursts of air into the instrument, but without any articulation. I can also add tonguing to that. So there's a little bit more punch to the sound, and that can be a more reliable to make sure that a more reliable way to get the pipes to speak. And then also, I can simply continue the air but release the fingers very quickly from the holes. So it kind of clips the sound and actually makes for a shorter staccato. So in combination, that can be very effective to get a very staccato effect. The other reason I might use just the fingered staccato is if there's a multi-voice part and one of the voices needs to be legato. Here's the same staccato demonstration on the larger instrument. 
This is just breath. Here's with tonguing. Notice that the pipes speak much more reliably because that little puff of air that comes from the tonguing articulation helps the note get started. And then finally, just with the fingers, you notice those low ones don't even speak very well. Here's another demonstration. If there's a legato voice and I use just a fingered staccato, in the upper voice it's totally fine, but if I flip it around, some of those low notes didn't even speak because the note's not down long enough to make it work. So this is an important thing to consider with the can in general. Remember that there's only one stream of air. So any rhythmic articulations that are applied with the tongue are going to affect all the voices that are sounding. So here's a case where if I want a legato line and then I want those staccato notes down low, I might want to add some rhythmic articulation to make sure that's going to bring out those low notes. But then that rhythmic articulation affects the upper voice. but the lower voice speaks more reliably. So that's one of the things that, even though it's a polyphonic instrument, there's only one sort of level of rhythmic articulation that's possible at a time, and it will affect all the voices. The syllable that I use when tonguing, like D, T, or K, it doesn't seem to make much difference on a can, so I wouldn't bother to try to specify that. Double tonguing is possible and useful for making very fast passages rhythmically articulate. It does not have to be specifically indicated. Here's an example of double tonguing. A few additional expressive possibilities that result through breath control. The first I call a breath tremolo. The can cannot do vibrato. There's no way to change the pitch of the pipe, but I can kind of emulate the effect of a vibrato with what I call a breath tremolo. It's literally just modulating the flow of air to create a tremolo effect. And this is, uh, this adds a kind of something analogous to an, an expressive vibrato. Here's a short passage in a piece by David Loeb, and I'll use a little bit of expressive breath tremolo towards the end of this little two-phrase segment. So again, you could notate something if you want that effect in a certain place, or just leave it to me. In a more uh, exposed and expressive passage like this example here, I might want to incorporate that. So if you really didn't want to say that, you could put an instruction like no breath tremolo or something like that. Um, another expressive effect is flutter tongue. Uh, and this is sort of standard flutter tongue, you can just write the word flutter tongue or F-L-U-T-T -T period above a passage to be played with flutter tongue. Uh, and it can be done with a kind of a, a, a mild intensity or a much more intensity, but it can only be done when breathing out. So here's a more mild flutter tongue. And then I'll uh, ratchet up the intensity. or even more. So it can be really articulate or it can be more subtle. Uh, but I cannot do it when breathing in. So that's something to bear in mind. If I have a flutter tongue passage, I'm gonna have to engage in breath, breath planning to make sure I can put it in the right place. Um, one interesting traditional technique, and you see this a lot with shung players also, is to do a kind of a grace note articulation that's a very short flutter tongue, but then the flutter tongue stops and the note sustains. So on the left of the screen, you see what would be the most precise, most detailed way to notate this. You can see a full chord, um, although of course it could be done on a single note as well, with 
an exact number of repetitions of that chord labeled as grace notes and a flutter tongue with a little bracket indicating that the flutter tongue stops before the main note. And that's a very conventional, traditional cadence, that full pentatonic chord releasing to an open fifth. I think it would also be perfectly acceptable to notate it as I show on the right. You don't have to put flutter tongue because it's really the only way to do that really fast grace note articulation. And it's easier to read not to rewrite all the notes. So whatever combination of that kind of notation you'd like to use, that would be fine. The final example here is the main theme from my composition, Epilogue for a Dark Day. And in this case, it combines both of these effects. You see there's the flutter tongue, grace note articulation preceding a sustaining note, and then that sus uh, sustaining chord. And that sustaining chord is also modulated with a breath tremolo. And in this case, I've asked for that breath tremolo to have a specific rhythm. Perhaps it's a little overly precise in the example, but the idea is that the rate of the tremolo slows down. So I had a way to notate that. And the intensity of the tremolo, that is sort of how much the modulation of breath is happening, is meant to diminish. So there's a hairpin that indicates that. So in order to do the flutter tongue on an out breath, therefore I need to start this main theme with an in breath. In this section of the video, I'm going to be talking about some of the basic concepts of traditional Lao and Northeast Thai can playing. For a more detailed look at these concepts, you can find references in the PDF guide on my website. You can also go to YouTube to find lots of great recordings of traditional music to listen to. In order to find those, you can search for the just search for the word can and search for some of the variant spellings. But you also turn up a lot more if you search in Thai and you search in Lao. So what I'm going to do is I'll paste in the description of this video the Lao and Thai characters for the word can. So you can just copy and paste those into the search bar in YouTube and you'll find a lot more videos to look at. The basic concept of melodic organization for traditional can playing is drone and melody. That is, the structure of the music has two parts, a drone or set of drones that don't change, and a melody. And the melody is monophonic, but can then be elaborated with lots of different techniques that I'll describe. What I'm not going to describe today is how the melodies are developed, the different concepts of genre, uh, and things like that. So for that, you can look at other sources. Um, let's start by talking about the drones. Drones are just notes that are held and don't really change or don't change for a long period of time. The easiest way to do it is just to hold it with the fingers. Um, beginning can players will often not hold it with the fingers because it's a little harder, but an advanced player should be able to hold many of the drones with their fingers, but I'll show you some cases where that's not true. So for example, if the highest note is used as a drone, I'm just gonna plant my pinky there and I can play and just not move it. So that works as a drone. But in some cases, you may wanna use a drone and traditional music actually calls for drones on other parts of the instrument where you don't wanna tie up a finger. And so instead, traditionally, the black waxy substance that's used to seal the can, it's called kisut. You can take a little chunk of that and stick it in the hole. Now here in San Diego where I live, the kisut gets too hard. I don't like to put it in there and the stuff gets stuck in the hole and it's really hard to take it out. So what I use is wall tack. It's a very cheap substance you can buy at the uh, office supply store and that makes a perfect stopper. And this can be placed on any of the holes and then that note will become a drone. And now all my fingers are free to play whatever I want. The notation I like to use for drones, and this is, I would prefer anyone writing for me, use this notation to indicate drones, in particular if the drones need to change through the course of a piece, um, is to have a note written where it begins, just in whatever the rhythmic context is, to show exactly where the note starts, but then tie it to a diamond. 
The can cannot play harmonics, so we don't need the diamond symbol for anything else. And the diamond can be sort of wherever is convenient to put it, but the tie to the diamond means it's gonna stay as a drone until, until that note is then indicated again to change. So on the left, you see the quarter note tied to a diamond. That means the A is gonna stay and be held as a drone. There'll be some music. And then when I want that drone to stop, the diamond again can kind of float around because the note is already sounding and then it's tied to a quarter note and then that quarter or whatever note. But the point is you can show the exact rhythmic location when that drone is to be released. So you could use a drone for a couple of measures or you could use it for an entire piece. If, if a note is just gonna be held for one measure or two measures and it works just as well to write uh, to tie a note rather than to use the drone notation, of course that's fine too. Um, one issue that we'll see with the can as I show you more contemporary examples in subsequent sections is you'll see the music can be pretty complicated in terms of the number of notes that are jammed onto the small staff. So cleaning up the notation by indicating sustaining notes as drones can help. It makes it a little more readable. Here's an example of the drone notation in action. This is just a short excerpt from my piece, Epilogue for a Dark Day. Uh, and in this piece, that first measure, the E is already being held as a drone, but it's gonna stop. So it's tied to a, to a half note, which is then tied to an eighth note. And so that indicates an exact location where that drone is gonna stop sounding. And then in the second measure, you see the low E and the low B are also tied two diamonds and so they become drones and then are held through the next section of the piece. Those diamonds, I've indicated them in the exact location where the half note would stop. So they're sort of in the durationally correct position following the half note. But if that third measure were too cluttered, you could also push the drones over to the left into the second measure. The point is once those notes are sounding, you can pretty much stick that diamond anywhere in proximity to the to the note to which they're tied from to show that those notes are going to be held. So here's this example. Here's the drone at the beginning and here's the music. And there's those two drones at the end that are left. So in this case because the drones are changing through the course of the piece I hold them all with my fingers. It is possible to use the wall tack and change drones through the course of the piece with the wall tack, but it's quite tricky. Um, in fact, I do call for this in the piece Epilogue for a Dark Day, and I wanted to show you um, how hard that is, kind of as a discouragement from asking to do it. The reason it's difficult is because it, what I do is I pre-position the wall tack close to the hole so I'm ready to grab it in the course of the piece. Now if the music has a pause, there's like a grand pause and I can take the instrument away from my mouth, hold it and put the wall tack, of course that's fine, there's plenty of time, but I actually wanna change it while I'm playing. What has to happen is that I need to be able to grasp the instrument with just one hand. And so for that, that means the notes that are sounding need to be all on one side. And it's really, really helpful that these outer pipes are included in the notes that are sounding because I can literally grasp the instrument with my thumb. Um, otherwise, it's pretty hard, it's basically impossible to do. And I'm also gonna tip the instrument to the side so I can hold all the weight with one hand and then use my other hand to put the wall tack on. So this will illustrate uh, how tricky it is and also how much time it takes. So you'll see I have a chord in the left hand and I add a note, there's a little bit of action in the left hand to, to take time for the right hand to put the wall tack on. And I'll turn this way so you can see the way I do it with the putty. That's the idea. So it takes a little bit of time and it's you really have to be careful. And of course, there can't be a lot going on in the other hand because mostly that other hand is occupied simply by holding the instrument. Traditionally trained can players learn to play in five different melodic modes. These are called lai, L-A-I. Each mode consists of one or more possible drone pitches and then a scale of notes, 
as well as a characteristic pattern of doublings and ornamentations that can be used to realize melodies that are played with the scale. So I'm going to show you the five different modes, the five lie. If you have a segment of a contemporary piece and you want it to sound like traditional music, what you can do is indicate which mode it's supposed to be played in, indicate which drones you prefer, and then just write a single monophonic melody. And any traditionally trained player will be able to turn that melody into something that sounds idiomatic by using these characteristic doublings and ornamentations. So I'm going to show you here the five lie. Here's the first one. It's called Lai Noi. And you can see what I'm showing you here on the left, the diamond notes are the drones. Um, there can be variation in which drones are used. Uh, the most standard one is to use both D and A. This can be, again, held with wall tack or a kisut um, to provide the drone. I prefer to use my finger because it lets me take the D on and off and I can get a little more control when the melody goes up high. And I left one off here. Sometimes players will use the lower D instead, instead of the high D. And so in combination with those drones that sustain are then all these melodic possibilities. What I'll show you is the basic scale in single notes and then I'll go back and show you some of the doublings. So that's a single note melody, but a traditionally trained player is going to be able to do much more than that because a lot of those melodic notes, as you can see in the diagram, will be doubled at the octave or doubled at the fourth or a fifth. Here's an example. So a melody will be improvised and it can be elaborated by doing these various doublings. Here's a little example of Lai Noi. It is also possible to use the note B and the note E in ornamental elaborations. And sometimes these can just be melodic ornaments, uh, sort of notes out of the mode, and sometimes it can sound a little bit more like a modulation. It's a little bit of the use of B and E as kind of secondary notes to the mode. So that's Lai Noi. Here is Lai Yai. Lots of different drone combinations in this one are possible um, with A or A and E. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the high E. I'll hold the highest A with my finger and give you a demonstration of both the notes and then the doublings that are typical of lai yai, literally means the big mode. And this one, the main notes are A, C, D, E, and G. And then the use of B as a kind of secondary tone is, is quite common. So I went ahead and I put it on the list. So those were single notes, so like say a basic melody in the lower register could be doubled in octaves or octaves and fifths. Okay, and then the B can be used, like I said, as a kind of secondary tone.
Now here's another mode. This is Lai Sutsanan, and the drones are Gs. And this one, I was, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, it has more of a major sound in comparison to the other two. Here's another one where I can hold both of the drones with my fingers. I don't have to put the, the wall tack in. Or with the doublings. That's doubling an octave. Here's octave and a fifth. In this mode, it is not unusual, again, to incorporate some of the additional notes as secondary modal tones. The B That was the use of the B, or the F, and the F can almost imply a kind of modulation to Lai Noi, the mode we did first. Okay, that's Lai Sutsanan. Here is Lai Bo Sai. The term literally means left thumb, and the, one of the drone notes is the high C, which is held with the left thumb. And sometimes it could be the low C instead. So I'll hold the high C. Again, I can do both of those with my fingers. And I'll play the uh, single notes and then with the doublings. That's Lai Bo Sai. And then this very similar mode, Lai Soi, is basically the whole thing, but one step higher. And in this case, I'll use the wall tack to stop the high D. And you'll see it has a very similar sound, but the doublings are a little different, and I have a new lower note. To learn more about traditional playing, I strongly recommend Terry Miller's book, The Traditional Music of the Lao, Can Playing and Malam Singing in Northeast Thailand. I'd like to take a second now and talk about modal theory, and you can also find this elaborated in Terry Miller's book. Players of traditional music talk about two kinds of scale, Tang Sun and Tang Yao. Literally, the terms mean long and short, and Terry Miller in his book talks about those terms originating in singing styles that refer to syllabic versus melismatic singing. But nowadays, the terms are commonly used to understand scales, and that'll help us understand how these five different melodic modes are related. Um, in fact, it is easiest to think of these with an analogy to Western music because it works very similarly. Tang Sun works like a major scale and Tang Yao works like a minor scale. And those will group the various modes into major minor pairs that use the same set of pitches. To make this clear, let's look at the first ones that you see on the chart. Lai Noi and Lai Bo Sai. So Lai Noi will sound like a minor scale. It uses D as the primary note. I'm going to just 
put the D, high D as a drone. So that's Lai Noi, and it is in Tang Yao, and it has a kind of minor sound because it has that minor third at the bottom. And then the same pitches, the same five pitches, can be reorganized into a major form, which is called Tang Sun, and that's known as Lai Bo Sai. That'll also come with a changed set of drones. So it's the same pitches as Lai Noi. But the drones are different, and the notes that's sort of regarded as the resting point of the melody is different. Now you'll notice the tang sun form, the resting point is not what we would think of as the, major, uh, the tonic of the major scale, which in this case would be F, but in fact it's the fifth, it's the C. So technically, I guess this would be a hypo-ionian form of the major mode, right? That's the idea. Um, so each of the lie can be understood as these pairs of a major form and a minor form, or a Tang Sun form and a Tang Yao form. So let's look at the second pair, uh, Lai Yai, which is the minor form of the following pentatonic mode. And then the same pitches with a different drone comprise Lai Sutsanan. And then finally, there's Lai Soi, and you'll notice all this time I've been talking about five Lai, five melodic modes, but according to this model, you see, of course, there are six. Um, traditional players all learn to play in the five Lai, and will be quite adept at playing in the five Lai. And the reason there are these different Lai, by the way, is to be able to play in different transpositions to suit the range of a singer. So the can traditionally accompanies a solo singer called a mwala. And if a singer says, hey, that's too low, rather than grab a different can, if they need to change pitch, they can just change into a different Lai and make, a, make something that play in the same style, but they have a different pitch level to better suit the singer. So there's generally two to pick from in Tang Yao. You can pick Lai, Na, Lai Noi or Lai Yai and basically play the same music in either one. And then there's three to pick from in Tang San. Lai Bo Sai, Lai Su Tsunan, and Lai Soi. And a player can play the three of those interchangeably. And they would basically work like transposing the same scale to make it more comfortable for the singer. So there is a sixth one, which is the pair, the Tang Yao form of Lai Soi, and it's called Lai Se, um, and it is extremely uncommon. It is very unusual for players to play this. Um, Terry Miller documents a little bit in his book. I have one recording of a player demonstrating it, but generally it's not a mode that people use, but it is possible. It's also not one that I've practiced, but just for the sake of allowing you to hear what it sounds like, it's basically like a transposed form of the other ones, because of course that's what they all are. So the drone would be the high E, In addition to using the characteristic doublings to realize melodies, traditional players can also incorporate various ornamentations into the melody. For example, they may use grace notes, and a grace note could just be one note, or parallel octaves, or even more than just one. So that can kind of brighten up a melody. Um, another technique is, I don't know a traditional name for this, I call it chord on attack. And it's a form of melodic accent that uses a big chord of notes that's released very quickly. So if I just play a melody by itself, um, an accent with the tongue or with the breath, you kind of don't get that much of an accent, but in the chord on attack, the effect is to play an entire chord, 
but then release very quickly all the notes except for the melodic one. So here in this example, I've got a melody that goes up, but I'll use the same chord on attack for all the notes. And that's a very characteristic uh, form of accent, especially when played in one of the traditional lie. And so that gives a much punchier accent than just using the breath or the tongue for an accent. So the name of that, I call it chord on attack, but to write it, you just write the chord that you want and give it a short uh, duration and possibly also add an accent mark to indicate the effect. Another, uh, another technique is a fingered tremolo, like this. Just to rapidly release and, and restrike the note. And that's typically done when playing in parallel octaves, but the tremolo is just done on the higher note. And it just adds a little bit of rhythmic activity and a little bit of color to the note. Traditionally, it's not really done on the lower notes, and part of the reason is the lower notes just don't speak as quickly, so it's not quite as effective. But it works. So here's a sample passage, a little fake traditional music passage that combines all these different techniques of ornamentation. And you see it's in the mode Lysutsanan with the two Gs as a drone, and there's grace notes. I use the two slashes or the three slashes to indicate the fingered tremolo in the upper voice. And then you'll see there's one chord on attack in there as well. Finally, there's one additional uh, technique of melodic ornamentation, which is not really a traditional technique. I use it a lot. I think you can find it here and there in traditional playing as well. And that's a tremolo between the two different Gs. Remember, there's the note G on either side of the instrument. Um, so this is two measures from the beginning of my composition. The wind blows inside, and it starts with the two Gs uh, slowly and then played as a tremolo. So to indicate that kind of tremolo, use the little LR under the note, because if you don't put the LR, if I see a G with the tremolo sign on it, that looks to me like just one G is tremoloed, like that. But when I see the LR under it, I know to do both. And because they're sustaining, each one can sustain before the next one is struck, it makes for a more connected sound. Here's the beginning of this piece. In comparison to standard Western orchestral instruments, the dynamic range of the can is a bit compressed. For solo pieces, this doesn't really matter. Whatever dynamic range is specified within a solo piece, I'll realize over the range that's possible with whatever instrument I happen to have selected. But for ensemble playing, when the can is played with other kinds of instruments, this is something to bear in mind. So I may not be able to achieve the same intensity of a fortissimo or the same quietness of a pianissimo as some of the other instruments. If that really turns out to be a problem, I have a clip-on mic that I can use with the can and that can help ameliorate some of those dynamic limitations. I also like to use the clip-on mic and amplify whenever I do a piece with can and electronics so that I have better control over the balance between the instruments. Now it's at the soft end of the dynamic range where things get interesting. And of course that's because the amount of air required to get a pipe to speak varies between the pipes. Um, and let me, let me show you an example of that. If I take this instrument, I'm going to play a tremolo, a slow tremolo between two notes. And I'm going to let the dynamics taper off. And what you'll notice is one of the notes continues to sound while the other doesn't. So that shows you that one of the pipes is actually able to be played more softly than the other one. 
But interestingly, on the draw, if I do the same thing, it's the other pipe that actually speaks at a quieter dynamic. So that kind of inconsistency or discrepancy between the pipes is completely normal for the can, but it's something that I have to contend with as a player. And so it does mean that if you're gonna write a, a phrase that tapers al niente, or you're writing at a very quiet dynamic, there may be some of those difficulties that will prevent me from being able to play extremely soft. I've gotta keep the dynamic level high enough that everything continues to speak. Here's another demonstration of where this could really be a problem. It can be beautiful to end a piece with a kind of uh, diminuendo al niente, and for a single note, that may work great. It just disappears to nothing. But if I play a chord, you notice the notes actually stop sounding at different times, and so it's not a very effective uh, device. And of course, I can't control which one's going to come off first unless I do it manually, which is a different kind of effect. So those are some of the issues to be aware of when the can is being asked to play at a very quiet dynamic. One other thing to understand is that once a reed is in motion, it's easier to keep it in motion even as the wind pressure drops. So if I allow my one of my notes to diminuendo to very soft, and then while that one is sustaining, I'll start playing another note, and you'll notice that other note doesn't sound because it takes more wind pressure to get a reed started than it does to maintain it. Whereas if I play a little louder, I can keep that, I can get that second note to come in. One way to think about dynamics with the can is to take inspiration from the harpsichord. On a harpsichord, one individual note cannot be played louder or softer. So in order to create a dynamic effect, players can control the number of voices or the number of notes that they play at the same time. So simply by voicing a chord with more notes or more doublings, it'll sound louder. So the same idea works on the can. Let me give a short demonstration with a phrase. So I'll start by playing just single notes. And I'm going to play at one level of wind pressure throughout. So this is a demonstration of how the texture can have a dynamic effect. This, of course, could then be coupled also with actual changes in wind pressure. But I'm going to try to maintain one level of wind pressure, and I'm going to play the same phrase four times. The first time, just single notes. The second time, in parallel octaves. The third time, I'll add two drones. And then the fourth time, I'll add some chords and chord on attack. So even though the level of wind pressure is the same, the instrument can be made to sound louder by the way it's voiced. Another example of this is my composition, The Wind Blows Inside, which consists of kind of a textural crescendo that spans the first four and a half minutes of the piece. In this section of the video, I'm going to show you three examples of contemporary pieces and discuss some of the issues with notation. All three of these examples are also good illustrations of the polyphonic capabilities of the can. Here in this first example from my piece, The Wind Blows Inside, there are three different parts. First of all, you'll notice the little low A there. That's a drone that's held throughout the passage. Then there's a melody played in parallel octaves uh, with some of the characteristic doublings of the mode la yai. And then finally, there's a kind of chordal accompaniment that's played in tremolo. And those are just separated with stems up and stems down. So you see how t using the drone notation already cleans up the, the, cleans up the appearance of notation by, making, by getting rid of what would otherwise have to be ties uh, crossing the lower voice. Here's this passage. <laughs> The second example is by Christopher Burns from the piece Triangulation. 
And here you see first two voice polyphony with some rhythmically uh, intricate interrelationships. And then in the second measure, a three voice polyphony. First there's that A that's held in the middle and then the A, that voice begins to move as well. For music which is more polyphonically complex or which has large chords, especially chords that are changing, it's more advantageous to notate the music on two staves. And in this case, I prefer that the notes played by the right hand be indicated on the upper staff and the notes played by the left hand on the lower staff. Here's an example by Yu Kuwabara from the piece Mystische Miniature that absolutely could not be notated on a single staff. First we have a 10 note chord. That chord with that many notes is much easier to read when it's broken up between the hands. And then it's followed by a hocketing passage with tied sustaining notes, but the ties sustain differently between the two hands. So this, this kind of music definitely needs to be notated on two staves. Here's what it sounds like. When it comes to extended techniques, there are not too many things available for the can. I wrote in my guide that half-hole technique, portamento, glissando, detuning, vibrato, and harmonics are not possible on the can. I could put one little asterisk on that in that there is a half-hole technique, but it's a little bit difficult to do and very unreliable and inconsistent between instruments. So if you're interested in that, it's something that it would be best to talk to me about. Because the holes are very tiny, there's really not a lot of possibility to half hole. Um, and as the as you begin to half hole, what happens is the pitch goes up, but very quickly will stop. Sometimes it'll stop sounding even if it's gone up less than a half step. And so it's really hard to sustain that note. And it tends to work better on an in-breath and better with a lot of air. But it's a pretty unreliable technique. It doesn't always work on all the notes. So like I said, if you're interested in that one, contact me and we can look at specific possibilities. But there are some extended techniques that are possible. The first is kind of simple. Um, but it's, it's not consistent with traditional playing. And that is to take the thumb or the pinky out of position, that is to have them play a note other than the ones that are usually uh, dedicated to them. So it's difficult to do uh, because there's a risk of losing grip on the instrument um, and quite literally dropping it because it's, it's sort of that grasping right there that can help hold the instrument. Um, but it is possible, especially if it's only one or the other, and especially if it's done on only one side of the instrument at a time. So here's an example from my piece Five Cycles. This is a cluster chord that's played and the pinky of the left hand has to go away from its position and play the F in this chord because there's no other way to do it. In order to make this possible, there's a slight break in the music. There's a phrase break before this chord that just gives me a chance to take the instrument away from my face a little bit and make sure that finger is in position. So playing it is no problem. And it helps that the other, the other side of the instrument, I've got the thumb and I've got a good grip on it. So there's no problem playing that chord. Here's another example from the piece Watawat by Sidney Bokirin. In this example, the thumb is taken out of position to play the low B. And you notice here's some big chords that he's notated on two staves, which is great. Um, so this is what it sounds like. So this note, oh, I already lost it. That's how, that's how hard it is to keep it in position.
using the thumb up is actually more difficult because it's being played, the hole is being covered with the side of the thumb and it's really easy to slip off or if I hit it with the nail, then the nail doesn't cover the hole. So this is another instance where there's a phrase break in the music that gives me a chance to get my thumb up there, to look at it, sort of feel it under my finger and make sure I've got it before I play. See, and as soon as I lift those notes, it starts to slip and I, it falls out of position. So it's a very uh, delicate thing. And once it's there, I kind of want to not change too much. If I start lifting notes, it's very likely that I'll lose that, that note where the thumb is out of position. The other extended technique, which is very effective, is singing into the instrument while playing. And here there's a lot of possibilities. Um, so let me show you here, for example, is I'll sing a single note and I'll play a melody on the can. So what happens is it tends to modulate the pitches that are close to the note being sung more so than the pitches that are far away. Um, here, conversely, is singing a melody over a fixed chord. And there's really all kinds of possibilities. I could sing below the range of the can. And there's really too many possibilities to demonstrate all the different things that could be done. One interesting thing, um, which is possible, is that I can control the relative dynamics of singing versus how much air goes into the can. It's a little bit tricky, but let me see if I can do a demonstration. I'm gonna play a pentatonic cluster chord. And I'll take away the bottom note and sing it instead. And what I'm gonna to try to do is I'll start by playing the chord quietly but singing loudly and then reverse it. So it is possible to separately indicate the dynamics of singing and playing at the same time. As far as notation goes, I definitely prefer the sung parts to be notated on a separate staff, above or below. Um, and of course, I can only sing on an out breath. So that's something to be taken into account. Here's an example of a very creative use of singing, as well as the technique of flutter tongue. This is from the piece Palpable Breathing by Vera Ivanova. And in the first part, the singing doubles the upper note of the chord. So it effectively doubles the melody, but then the sung note stops while the melody continues to go up. It does work to sing into the instrument even without blowing into it because those vibrations from the voice will cause the, some of the reeds to resonate. And that was a glissando, which is also possible, and that could be done with a chord as well. <laughs> And one other trick that I've done with singing is to hint at expanding the range of the instrument. So in my piece, Tashi Delek, I wanted one note lower than the instrument was able to give me. And so I just sang that note. Uh, it sounded like this. Breath sounds are possible with the instrument, but breathing into the instrument 
tends to produce very little sound and runs the risk of causing the reeds to activate or whine. So when a composer calls for breath sounds, what I'll often try to do is just, uh, I'll actually release the embouchure here and allow air to escape through the side and I can make that much more audible. So if I blow through the instrument, you get much less sound. Another option to consider with air sounds is that the ends of the pipes, these are all bamboo tubes. And finally, one other uh, extended technique is a kind of a guiro effect. I can scrape the bamboo to produce a percussive sound. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. I hope this has inspired you to consider writing for the can. I encourage you to check out my website where you can find a list of contemporary pieces and links to recordings. And you can also purchase scores of my can pieces. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or post a comment in the video. Happy composing.